This is the innovator of Oz, Tommy Dreamer. You're listening to Audibly Offensive Radio, right here, taking you to the extreme. In 2008, a cracked-out sports show was sent to prison by a military court for a crime they didn't commit, the comedic murder of Oakland Raiders owner Al Davis. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the AO Team. Audibly Offensive Radio. In 1935, a tradition was born in college football when the Downtown Athletic Club of New York City awarded the Heisman Memorial Trophy to Jay Berwanger of the University of Chicago. In 2009, Audibly Offensive Radio began our own tradition by handing out the whiskers that we call the Ron Goldman Classic. Tonight, we hand out that trophy and possibly a little more irony. We take a look at baseball's hot stove, the already looming coaching carousel in college football and bowl games. And I promise, I'm not going to gloat. Okay, I lied. I'm sorry. However you may be listening to us, whether it's on WWP and MediaNet, 101.9 Fox FM, Max Sports Channels, Fat Sports Radio, Radio PGH, Bar Talk Sports, RMTR Radio Online. Thank you for making this week's edition of Audibly Offensive Radio the best hour of your week and your sports, your source for sports knowledge. Good God, I cannot talk tonight. This is going to be an interesting show, and it's live, so I'm fucked. Um, my name is Patrick Swafford. Thank you guys so much. And in addition to listening to us on any of our affiliates, if you're downloading us on our very own website, uh, audiblyoffensive.com, we thank you for that because that makes us money. Not really, but it just sounded good we got a very very big show tonight it's it's probably one of the three biggest shows that we do all year in addition to the wrestlemania preview and well actually the four for the big four just like there are big, four big pay-per-views in the world of pro wrestling there are four big shows on audibly offensive radio easily it's the it's the ron goldman classic it is the year in review it is the ao bowl and um shit i forgot the other one um, never mind. WrestleMania. Yeah, yeah, the WrestleMania show. Thank you. The one that started off this whole conversation. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Again, it's been a very long day. I'm going on a lack of sleep, so you're probably either going to get me really pissed off or you're going to get me really loopy or both. This is going to be an interesting show. Uh, before we get into all of the wonderfulness of the past week, let's go ahead and bring in my co-host, a man who we all know and love, and we consider him... The authority in being the asshole savant that he is, ladies and gentlemen, my best friend, Mr. Chris Lunke. This week's Audible Offensive is brought to you by Playoff Saving Time. Every year we either spring forward or fall back, but now we bring you a brand new tradition. Instead of being forced to watch the Big Ten fall apart in the PCS Championship, with Playoff Saving Time in effect, they make sure that you, the loyal college football viewer, aren't forced to waste your time watching a horrible team that will get out of the way before the game so you aren't bored and you don't accidentally die via autoerotic asphyxiation. Hey, thanks, Big Ten. What the fuck? (laughs) Dude, that might be one of the most fucked up ones you've ever done. Because I did autoerotic asphyxiation? Can you play in excess in the background? Uh, Well, no, (laughs) because I just don't want to download it. I'm being lazy tonight. That's just all there is to it. Uh, but it, it, Yeah, we're, and we will talk about that here in a little bit as we get into leading off. Leading off, which is, it is each and every week. It's brought to you by our good friends at electricdemon.com. Web hosting contact Mark Crocker at mark at electricdemon.com for all your web hosting needs. Because electricdemon.com web hosting is the official online supplier of IW Offensive Radio. It's also brought to you by our good friends at Entropy Clothing. Um Let's talk some bowl games, buddy. I posed to you a few questions before we get into um, the breakdown of the conference championship games from this past Saturday. Now that the dust is settled and the smoke is cleared and we have, as I've been playfully predicting it all season long, plunged into the ninth circle of hell, um, the national title game is set. It's Florida State, and I still can't believe I'm saying this, Auburn. Did the right one-loss team get in the championship game. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I mean, I don't know what else you wanted this team to go out there and do. Uh, They played 
some of the best football that we've seen uh, when it mattered the most. They had the best strength of schedule of any of the qualifying teams. Uh, and they did. They went out there and played a, a very, very, very good Missouri team and dominated them with a game that just absolutely shocked me. Um, they've done it the past three games, have just gone out there and absolutely shocked the world. And for as much as people even expected them to beat Missouri, for them to have beat Missouri in that fashion was incredible. 500 500 yards rushing total for the entire team, which is terrifying. I mean, it's unreal. Yeah, it, it was absolutely unreal. Yeah, and defense came up when it needed to come up, and I mean, you just did everything right. Right, and for those of you wondering, no, we are not going to be breaking down the national title game today. We will be saving that for the week before when we do the full blown breakdown for the BCS title game, like we always do. Um, I do agree with you, Chris. I do believe that Auburn is the right one loss team. Um, the only other option you could have really and legitimately had was Alabama, but you couldn't put Alabama in there for two reasons. Number one, they didn't play in their conference title game, and number two, the conference champion of their conference beat them. Um, but to be fair, two years ago, they didn't play in their conference championship and they went to the BCS championship game and won. But they play, they didn't play in the conference title game, but they played the team that that beat them. Yeah. Which, by the way, uh, that was LSU. Yeah. All right, just I'm just saying. Out. So you can you can go without having won your conference. Oh, well, you absolutely can. But the only way you can do it is when you're playing the team that – Won your conference. That's the only way you that can we, do it. Yeah, that's we've seen it so far. That's the only way you can do it is when it's when it's an interconference national title game, and we've only seen that happen one time, and that was a couple, and that was two years ago. Um, but I still think that you could make a better case for uh, Auburn and Alabama playing again than you can for even Florida State. No, you have to put Florida State in there for the simple. You fight. have to because they're undefeated and whatnot. But they had a worse strength of schedule than even uh, Ohio State did. They just had. A much, 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 much better season. Right, and but and the only thing that looks good for them is they played four ranked teams this year, and only two of them currently are still ranked. That's yeah. just that that that's that's that. Um, but I do agree with you. I do believe that the right one loss team did get in. I think they are they are the bigger story in my opinion, not necessarily Florida State's team and how great they look and how many guys they have that will play at the next level like Kelvin Benjamin and Jameis Winston and half of that offensive line and all uh, of that defense yeah all that defense Nick O'Leary you know you can go on and on but the story is going is the story is not going to be in the next 30 days it is not going to be Florida State's offense versus Auburn's defense it's going to be <clears throat> how in the hell is Florida State going to stop that how in the hell is Florida State going to stop a team that ran for 300 yards against Bama ran for 500 yards against Missouri by the way both of those teams statistically had a better rushing off rushing defense going into that game than Florida State does. Yeah, I mean, they even torched LSU on the ground. They, uh, they, they, I mean, they torched everybody on the ground. That's... Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, we talk about it, and I can't, I, I hate to keep bringing this, this analogy up, but we talk about momentum. We talk about hockey playoffs. If you've got a red hot goalie, you win the cup. It's almost a given. You get momentum and you win. This is that same vein right there. You know, this is a team with all the momentum in the world. They're playing with house money. But we're going to get all into, into the rest of that in a little bit. Let's go ahead and move into the next of the three questions. Which BCS Bowl, aside from the national title game, are you looking forward to the most? And which one are you looking forward to the least? I, I think it's, it's a no-brainer for me. And I think it's going to be a no-brainer for just about everybody. Um, and that's going to be the Rose Bowl uh, with Michigan State and Stanford. Two very, very, very good defenses. Two teams that rely very much on the on uh, the run. Um, and passing is going to be secondary. And I don't know how you're going to pass against either one of those, uh, defenses. those defenses. Yeah. Those, those corners are just awesome. Uh, they made Braxton Miller, Michigan State look, made Braxton Miller's uh, passing offense look just stupid. Um. So, yeah, I think that game is far and away I, I, 
way more interesting than any of the other lineups. I completely agree. I mean, you know, every, you know, the the true football fan love, you know, should should be able to say, I love grown man football. Grown man football is run it between the tackles and beat the crap out of the other guys, the guys on defense. You know, it's put your head uh, it, down and it's it, it's just smash mouth. I mean, it's God pounds his nails. Yeah, I, it was funny because uh, Pat and I were still going absolutely nuts with Ohio State losing. And I, I just sort of had like a small moment of clarity. And that's when I texted Pat and I said, you know, what's kind of getting lost in all of this is the Rose Bowl is going to be an awesome match. And then I had a football boner. Yeah, it really is. It's going to be a hell of a game to watch. Oh, it, it's going to be, and it's going to be, you know, it, it reminds me a lot of, you remember, what, what was it, a couple of years ago when you had uh, that smash mouth, ugly ass game between Wisconsin and TCU? Yeah. Which, by the way, you said was boring. You said you hated it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I do remember very, very, very distinctly me watching the game. You're like, this game sucks. I'm like, I ought to slap you. Anyway, which game are you? Which one of the BCS bowls are you looking forward to the least? Uh, Fiesta, as always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Central Florida and Baylor. You know, uh, Baylor looked solid uh, in their last game, but God, the two games before that just looked terrible. Uh, and UCF, you know. It would be more interesting if Louisville was in, but, you know, you, Bridgewater had one bad game, one bad game, and it cost him a chance to go to the BCS. Completely agreed. For me, for me, I, I just got to go. I, I just got to go with it. it it's, for me, it's, it's, it's the sugar. It's Oklahoma and Alabama. It's two teams that I absolutely despise. But I, I, I was thinking about this last night. Now, for those of you that obviously don't hang around with us and aren't really, really familiar with us personally, we got a friend uh, what's actually one of Chris's friends, but I've become friends with him in the time that uh, we've both been up here in the north um, by the name of Greg. And Greg, first off, awesome dude. Love him to death. Only bad thing about him is Greg's an Oklahoma fan. And not only an Oklahoma fan, but Greg is an Oklahoma apologist. He thinks the sun shines out of big game Bob Stoops' asshole. Yeah, I literally – it was it was funny. I I'll always remember that was the first time I, I didn't realize that uh, big game Bob in Oklahoma wasn't uh, an ironic nickname. Yeah, I know. I, I know. But here's, here's the thing. Because I have – because as much as I despise Alabama and Nick Saban – and Alabama fans. I look at the fact of Oklahoma fans as a whole look at the Sooners and look at Bob Stoops as this mythical genius. You know, he's this amazing football coach, and he's, in my opinion, one of the most overrated coaches in sports, not just college oh, football, but sports. Yeah. I, I got to say something, man. And I've. It, it, it's something that I never thought in a million years I'd say, but – Yeah, you don't need to say that. I, did, I, I honestly feel like I got to. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, you don't really need to say that. Are you sure? Because, I mean <laughs> – Yeah. I mean, I mean if you're thinking – if you're going to say what I think you're going to say, the show is going to be over, and I will take a flamethrower to this place. You know what? You're, I, I kind of agree with you. I feel – I, I, I mean – you got a bad thing. You're on a ledge here, man. This is a precipice. This is a crossroads. This is the end of uh, Castaway, where you can go back and you can look at this. You can say, "Oh, okay. Well, well I'm going to go down this road and I'm going to go and see, you know, what's going on with Helen Hunt." Or you can realize that Helen Hunt is really not that attractive in the first place, and Paul Reiser was, you know, kind of scoring even, and that's saying a lot because Paul Reiser's not very attractive either. Or you can go. That redhead was kind of cute. Let's go forward. Let's keep going. Let's go on the path that, that is going to lead us further. You're on a ledge, man. Step back from the ledge. I was expecting to hear think about your family. <laughs> <laughs> your family's going to stop talking to you. That's what your family's going to stop doing. Good point. Well, oh, no, 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 don't say that. I shouldn't have said that. That's going to make you say it more. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Well, I'm okay. I won't say that. I won't. I won't say those words. But I will say this. I'm because you you will have no problem doing this because I've seen you do it before. 
I'm actually going to cheer for Alabama in that one. And that's why I'm not looking forward to this game because I'm like, ah, damn it. I'm going to cheer for Bama on this one. I'm going to hope that Bama kicks the ever-loving crap out of Oklahoma. All right, let's go ahead and move into the other parts of bowl of the bowl season. What non-BCS bowl excites you the most, and which one are you just like, really? We're going to have to watch this crap? Um, had USC not been going through the middle of all of this uh, turmoil right now, I, I would say Fresno State and USC because I just want to see what Carr is going to do against a big boy defense. Um, Wisconsin, South Carolina could be – I, I literally I, – I got this question and I sat there and I looked up and down and up and down trying to figure out what I was going to say for most interesting. And there's there's just none. The answer is none many. None many. None many. There, there's not a game on here that I'm like, I really want to make sure I watch this. I really want to make sure I catch. There's not one. It, this is a, a, a awful, awful bowl slate this year. Yeah, I mean, you've got a lot of bowls. Because I'm going to be honest. This is the first. I'm at, Real time, I'm looking at it right now just going, ugh. Um, yeah, you get out of the BCS bowls, which the BCS bowls in large are not bad at all. Um, the only one that even looks remotely what the only one that looks remotely watchable is South Carolina, Wisconsin. Oh yeah, that's true. That was uh, a year ago and we got the clowny, uh, uh, highlight of the year. Uh, I want to point out one thing real quick. I'm glad you said highlight of the year. You know, we were talking in January. Oh my God, this will be the play of 2013. Yeah. About that. <laughs> Yeah, really. The last um, couple I, of weeks, we've had we've had stuff that's just kicked the shit out of that. Yeah, and it's all by one team. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, really, go, just going up and down this. Uh, I mean, are you excited for BYU Washington? Mm-mm. No. How about Rutgers Notre Dame? No, not really. Rutgers uh, made a bowl game. Yeah, uh, Bowling Green and Pitt. No. no. Buffalo, oh. San Diego State. I got, I got Arizona, better. BC. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got one. I got a better one for you. Oregon and Texas. Yeah, I mean, ugh. Even when you look at some of the big name ones, I mean, I, I, I'm not even excited for my own this year. Uh, Iowa and uh, LSU. That's just ugh, ugh. Texas A&M and Duke. Oh, it, it's just awful. It's, you know, te- it's just an awful slate. Uh, Arizona State and Texas Tech. If it was Arizona State now and Texas Tech two months ago, maybe. I looked at that one for for a half a second, and then I was like, you know what? Texas Tech just lost five games in a row. Um, Syracuse, Minnesota, no. Cincinnati and North Carolina, no. Uh, hey, Michigan, Chris, Kansas State, no. No, I, I found one. That, I found one that might might actually be watchable aside hey, from Wisconsin, South Carolina. And it's not Ole Miss, Georgia Tech. Please. No. The Cotton Bowl, Missouri and Oklahoma State. Yeah, I am looking. Isn't that? Yeah, that's right. The Cotton Bowl is not. The Cotton Bowl is Alabama not a BCS. The, yeah, that's. I, I I threw myself off of that one. I always get confused with the Cotton Bowl. Um, yeah, Cotton Bowl. I, I'm I almost made my uh, ones that I'm looking forward to in the bowl games. So. <laughs> yeah. So so it. it let, let's that's go ahead. it. It's, it's unanimous. The Cotton Bowl is the one we're looking forward to, and every and you know, options op, options two through thirty whatever are the ones we're not looking forward to. Yeah, I would honestly rather spend a day of watching uh, uh, a Jennifer Lopez film marathon than most of these bowl games. Oh, good God! Yeah. So yeah, you, and you, Sheely you, would be more entertaining than having to see Arkansas State and Ball State. Nice. Um, all right. Well, now we've, uh, now we've wrapped up the bowl games. Let's go ahead and quickly move into, before we get into done and not done, let's talk about how we got here. Um, obviously, we're not surprised. I think it's safe to say that Ohio State lost. But are you surprised that they lost the way they did? Uh, No. See, no, I, I'm not. See, I am. I am I, because this is a team that, yeah, they've struggled against teams that they should have absolutely handled. But with the exception of a couple of games like the Michigan game, once they've gotten into the second half and they've put their foot on their opponent's throat, they haven't let up. 
that's why I'm not surprised that they lost the way that they lost. I think if Michigan State was going to have any chance of beating them because their offense is so anemic, you it was mandatory for them to go up and score two rounds of 17 unanswered points. I mean, that's the only way you would have – you needed that, that huge lead because it changes the entire dynamic – of how you're going to play. Carlos Hyde is less of a factor now because he can't touch the ball every time because now you're looking at a clock. Right. Um, so if Michigan State w- was going to win that game, that's how they had to do it. I bring, you bring up a fair point. I, 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 I don't think you can play a close game. I don't think Michigan State could have played a close game with Ohio State. That's the only way I think you that could have won. And, and look what happened. I mean, Ohio State scored pretty much at will when they finally got their shit together. And it took Michigan State rallying in a uh, a fourth and two stop, which I thought the fourth and the, the call on fourth and two by Urban Meyer was just terrible. Going for going for that out that outside sweep option, I'm like the fuck are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. He doesn't have the big bodies that he had at Florida. But still, I mean, Hyde, you know, for fourth and two, you know, put the ball in Carlos Hyde's hands. Yeah, you would imagine, but yeah. that's not what was happening. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let let's talk about the other the the, the other you know ja- gigantic elephant in the room, and that is the SEC title game. And holy crap, that was a lot of offense. Yeah, I wasn't anticipating that much. Um, I figured Auburn would win, and I figured it would be a comfortable margin. And uh, you know, uh, but fifty nine to forty two. I mean, there, there's no way you would have predicted that. No, there's there there's. I no... meant I keep meaning to go back and, and look and see what the over under was for that game. The over under on that was, I believe, sixty, sixty ish. Oh, I definitely would have gone over on that. Uh, yeah, I probably would have too. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and we'll get to this in a little bit. A lot of people believe, and obviously, as you saw with the he- with with the actual Heisman finalists that were that were announced today, it's very conceivable that Trey Mason played his way into New York. Off of the off of the last two games, the the game against Bama and then the SEC title game this past Saturday against Mizzou. It's yeah, great. I mean, when you show up in big moments like that, that's what the Heisman's all about. Yeah, and he definitely did, which is why he's one of the six finalists that are going to New York this Saturday, which is just unbelievable. Well, let's go ahead and move on to our next topic. It's one of Lemke's favorites, so why don't you introduce it? All right, well, we're going to break this down because it's done and not done time. So if you got a chance to be in a BCS championship game, then we're not done with you. But if you're Ohio State, guess what? You're done. All right, I'll go first. I am done with punishing kids for having just a little bit of fun. Okay, apparently the University of Oregon has suspended starting tight end Pharaoh Brown for his role in a, air quotes here people, mob mentality snowball fight on campus. Now, no one was hurt in this snowball, this dangerous, terrible thug-like snowball fight, but apparently several people had buckets of snow dumped on them. You know, they... Did you see the video? No. It was kind of messed up. Oh, it was? Yeah, like they were standing in front of cars, and then the second people opened their cars to yell at people, then they were dumping snow on them. And uh, one of the guys deserved it, though, because he got out of the car, and with like all of these different people around him, he went after the smallest girl. Oh, okay, yeah. Then you just, you know, then you beat his ass. Yeah, but I mean, like he—that's the one person he decided to challenge, despite there being football players and all this other stuff. Um, there, there. I mean, people are talking about criminal charges for some of the students that did it. it. It was, it was a little ridiculous. But the video, like when I read the story, it was like, oh come on. And you see the video, and you're like, all right, they kind of took this to an excessive length. All right, well, I haven't seen the video, so I digress. I am it's not. Still, just- it's a snowball's fight. Right. I am not done with the writing on the wall. All right, and that's been rumored all season long that Alabama's Nick Saban could bolt for uh, bolt Tuscaloosa for Austin, Texas, and the University of Texas. Now it surfaced that current uh, UT coach Mac Brown's buyout is significantly less than your average buyout for a high-profile coach. Mac Brown would only be owed $2.75 million if Texas parts ways with him in the next year. Um... Duh. You're up. All right. Well, I am done 
with the BCS. It's over. We don't have to whine about it anymore. It's gone. The playoff system is here. And oh my God, how awesome would this playoff system be this year? You realize, Patrick, you would have the biggest conniption of all time. Because in order to be in the championship game, we would be looking at Iron Bowl 2. The Iron Bullying. Yes. How, how sick would that be? I, I would see that playoff parrot and just go, son of a bitch. <laughs> and that's how you lose for winning. Yes, and that's um, <laughs> how you lose while winning. And, but it's over. It's over, 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 it's over. It's over. BCS, go fuck yourself. Signed, audibly offensive radio. Yes. I am not done with the NHL handing down perhaps its most severe suspension ever to the Bruins' Sean Thornton for his absolute, complete, 100% bullshit hit on Brooks Orpik on Saturday night. If you have not seen it, where no team was in the right here. James Neal just got five games for uh, kneeing a player in the head. But during that scrum, Thornton comes up, grabs Orpik, who's not involved in this in any way, shape, or form, spins him around, throws him on the ground head first, and then starts pummeling him. If this didn't happen in a sports environment, Thornton would be in prison. That's how bad this was. Orpik had to have, was unconscious. They had to have a stretcher brought out, and he had to be taken to the emergency room to regain consciousness. It was ridiculous. The closest thing I can even compare this to is Albert Hainsworth stepping on the the hand of another player. No, it wasn't a hand. No, it they, was the that's head. right. It was, the, it was the head of a player with his football spikes. And or what Todd, happened to Hainsworth? Yeah, or Todd Bertuzzi, who rode Steve Moore into the ice and broke his neck. I, I Hainsworth, I think, is the the modern example because he was gone for the year. Right. And that's exactly what Thornton needs to have. He needs to be gone for the year. It was that freaking egregious. Completely, completely agreed. So let's go ahead and move into the world of the National Football League. You're up. All right. Well, this is going to be an interesting one. How do you feel about the news that came out today? That the Super Bowl at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey... We'll only have about 13,000 parking spaces for an 80,000-seat stadium. And fans will not be allowed to tailgate. And they will not be allowed to walk to the stadium. And they will have to purchase a $51 pass to ride the public transportation to get to the stadium. I'm taken aback by all this because I'm all I can think is, you know – the. The Super Bowl is a logistical nightmare for any city. I don't care who it is. It is the largest media event in the world all year long, with the exception of the Olympics and the World Cup. It's the, those are the only two things that draw more media attention than the Super Bowl. The only difference is the Super Bowl happens every year and the World Cup and the Olympics happen every four. Um, To me, this is a complete and utter failure by not only New York City, but also East Rutherford, New Jersey, and and both states. Because obviously both, both states are having a lot to do with travel arrangements to and from the stadium. Um... We always make wrestling references on this show. Let me take you back to one year. Actually, let me take you back to earlier this year. WrestleMania, WrestleMania 29, was held in this exact same stadium. No problems. WrestleMania is as not as big of an event, but it's pretty damn close because you have people from all over the world, wrestling fans from all over the world coming to one central location for one show, probably two because a lot of them hang out and, and, and go to Raw the very next night. Um, no problems there, but 
to me, I think this is more of a money grab than anything else. Oh, we can make them do this and we can make them do this by shutting everything down. Um, this isn't the Super Bowl. This is a George Orwell novel. Yeah, I didn't even realize that Jerry Jones had anything to do with the Super Bowl in New Jersey. I didn't either. Uh, um, no, this is a joke, and this isn't like something that just got announced either, uh, them hosting a Super Bowl. We've known about this for how many years now? About two or three, and we've been, yeah. praying, and we've, we've been praying for snow every damn day. And you know what? Oh, it's a fucking blizzard now. Well, we that's going to be our next topic and how that's going to affect the Super Bowl. Yes. But, I mean, this is an absolute – this is a joke. This is a real serious joke. Then they need to get their shit together and figure out what they're going to be doing. I mean, at this point, you might as well bring in FEMA buses. How are you not going to tailgate? How is, how are you going to even try to eliminate that? You're going to piss off everybody that is in the vicinity of this stadium. Right. Oh, and here's something even here's something else I didn't even throw in the notes. Celebrities and VIPs that come to the game, you know, generally they are dropped off in their little black limos and their black cars so they can have their little red carpet moment. Their cars will have to stay in the parking lot. They won't be allowed to leave. Oh, God. So we're going to have celebrities being flown in like the helicopter guy? The pretty, biggest fan. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. You'll have yeah. Justin Timberlake will pull basically the same shit that the get that the idiot did from the uh, Riddick Bow and uh, um, um, Evander Holyfield fight when he when he uh, uh, fan yeah. fan man whatever fan fan dove in. Yeah, right. and his fans gonna look like Janet Jackson's nipple. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> no, this this is seriously setting itself up to be a, a, a massive uh, PR disaster. I mean, you saw how much money uh, Jerry Jones had to pay out because of uh, poor accommodations and, and and Jerry World for the Super Bowl. This could pose even a bigger problem. Oh yeah, I yeah. This is going to be. Bad. You know what's um, going to be more hilarious is how this is going to affect things politically for Chris Christie. Oh yeah, who you know is the, I guess the candidate for was he Republican? Yeah, he's he's a preeminent candidate. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I yeah, this will do nothing. Be nothing but bad for him. Anyway, let's go ahead. That's and one of the things with Mitt Romney was that he organized uh, a bunch of the Olympics and stuff like that, and they talked about his ability. to to control things that way. Uh, Christy, you might want to get on this, man. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, you Americans are sports fans. Um, anyway, um, let's go ahead and move into the next one. All right. Yesterday's Lions and Eagles game. Fun or clusterfuck? And how is and how would that something was... like this affect the Super Bowl if this were to happen in New Jersey? Uh, the game yesterday was a blast. It was fun to watch. It was fun to see. I enjoyed it. You know, every time that somebody had to dive for the ball that came up, that Calvin Johnson picture with him and his entire face match just covered in snow. Uh, it was awesome. I had a good time watching it. If that were a Super Bowl, it would have been a clusterfuck. Oh, yeah. If, if you were trying to decide uh, a championship based on that, then you have a massive problem. Yeah, I mean, this is it would be worse than the Super Bowl that Super Bowl where Peyton Manning and the Colts beat the Chicago Bears when it just rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. Yeah, th th this would, yeah. So yeah, regular season game, it was fun, even with all the playoff implications on the line. Um, but it, it, in a real serious environment like that, I, I think it it'd be a disaster. I hope it happens. Um, uh, how, about the, how about another high-profile game that we had yesterday with Carolina and New Orleans? Did we learn anything from that one? I think we learned a little bit from that one and not so much necessarily in terms of whether or not Carolina is good or bad. We learned that New Orleans is very much still alive in terms of the best team in the NFL. Uh, after they got handled by Seattle, a lot of people questioned whether or not New Orleans would be able to bounce back. 
But all this simply means is whoever ends up with home field advantage in the NFC will win the Super Bowl because that means either Seattle has to go to New Orleans or New Orleans has to go to Seattle. It's going to come down to one of those two. New Orleans is not dead yet in terms of this in terms of this discussion. Um, Again, like I said, whoever has home field in the NFC, in my opinion, the number one seed in the NFC will win the Super Bowl. Because, like yeah, I said, yeah, it's really looking that way. Um, because you're, I, I not, we, you're, you're not beating New Orleans in the Superdome, and you're not beating Seattle at whatever the name of that stadium is, CenturyLink Field. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I thought New Orleans came out. They responded well. They played well. I I, I loved even what Drew Brees said uh, last week after the Seattle game. People are like, you know, do you do you feel like? Um, not being able to win on the road affects you guys and what, how that makes you play. And Drew Brace says, do you realize that in the past three years, we're the winningest road team in the NFL? Yeah. So maybe shut up. Yeah. It's like, um, like, it's like Peyton Manning saying, whoever said I can't throw in the, throw in the cold needs to take that, take that and shove it where the sun don't shine. I yeah. love that. That was awesome. Yeah, it was. Um, I, if, for me, I you know, I almost kind of took away from it, you know. God, Seattle is just that good. Yeah. That that was kind of what I took out of it. Is Seattle is that good? Yeah. Well, which brings us to our next topic: Does Seattle's loss to San Francisco change your opinion on who is the best in the NFC? Not even remotely. I good teams are going to have off games. They had an off game against the Colts. Uh, they had an off game uh, uh, here. Uh, San Francisco is playing better right now, and Seattle, San Francisco needed this game more than Seattle uh, did in any way, shape, or form. Agreed. Uh, San Francisco needs this because this was a, a marked loss for them, and they're uh, fighting for that sixth seed with Arizona. Um, so I, I, I didn't read too much into that, to be perfectly honest. Okay. Uh, Seattle just got a, a, a later start to get going, and it cost them. Completely agree. All right, let's go ahead and move into power rankings. Uh, we're not going to talk about ranking teams and anything else. We're going to talk this week about, you know, obviously our top fe- our, our top five and our top three. Your top five is your top five hottest of the hot seats in all of sports. And then we're going to wrap that up with the with kind of a coinciding topic, the top three best soon to be vacant coaching positions. Um, go for it. All right, I'm going to do mine five to one. Five hottest hot seats in sports. Number five, Mike Woodson, New York Knicks. Okay. It's looking pretty bad over there. Number four, I still love him, but Bo Pelini in Nebraska. Ugh, not good. Uh, that that last game against Iowa was a joke. Yep. Number three, Mike Smith, Atlanta Falcons. Can you beat anybody? Oh, my God. Uh, number two, who I would imagine most people are going to have number one, that's Mike Shanahan for the Redskins, who came out today and said, I'm thinking about benching RG3 for the rest of the year. Because what? Exactly. And number one, Mike Sosa of the Angels. Ooh. Yeah, crossing the stream a little bit. Uh, you bring in all of these high-profile players, you bring in all of this talent, and you've got basically one guy who's winning games for you, and that's despite the management. Mike Sosa, I don't know if you last a month if you guys have a rough start. Right. Well, here's mine from 5-1. to one. I've, At number 5, I've got Greg Schiano of the Tampa Bay Bucks. I still don't think he's safe, even though he's won a couple games lately. Uh, number 4, Mike Smith of the Atlanta Falcons. My number three is not on your list, my dear friend. Will Muschamp, University of Florida football. He got a resounding uh, note of approval from the AD. Just uh, because you get a note of approval doesn't mean that you're going to get I know. Bo Pelini did, got one too, and I, I believe he's going to get less time than Muschamp. Yeah. No, my number two is Mike Woodson. I don't think Mike Woodson makes it to the end of the month. And Mike Shanahan. I don't think Mike Shanahan makes it to the end of the week. Yeah. Uh, my, my, Especially after that came out today. Yeah. All right. So your top three best soon to be making coaching positions. Go for it. All right. Number three, I've got Atlanta Falcons head coach. 
This is a team that's rife with talent. They're a little injured right now, but somebody's going to be able to go in there and inherit this mess. Uh, and I think you could be looking at a situation where uh, you had uh, Tony Dungy and uh, 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 what's his face? Gruden. Yeah. He's been inheriting awesome teams. Uh, number two, Lakers head coach. Mike D'Antoni, I think this is his last year coaching. I think he'll make it all the way through. But if you're trying to bring in players like Carmelo, I doubt that Mike D'Antoni is going to be there. Uh, and number one, and this is number one, is a huge chasm giant gap between number one and number two. And that is the head coach of the Texas Longhorns. Yeah. Easily the best job that's about to be available. I disagree. I have at number three the new the head, head man of the New York Knicks because, like I said, Mike Woodson won't make it. Won't Mike Woodson? I'll even do you, but what do you want better? Mike Woodson won't make it to Christmas. Yeah, but that team is a mess. I know he will not make it to Christmas. <laughs> My number two. Well, actually, you know what? I don't have a number two. I have a number one and number one A because. Both of these, not only number one, are they both huge jobs, and they're probably two of the best jobs and the biggest jobs you could ever have, but they also coincide with each other because it's it's the head it's the head coaching position at football for the University of Texas and the University of Alabama. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'll bet you dinner. I, okay. I'll bet you dinner. Okay. I'll bet you a burger. That's I bet you, no, bet you, burger. Bet Come you on, steak. Can we go out for something nice? All right. I bet you steak. Okay. Bet, uh, bet you steak. Can we do sushi? We're, That's kind of our thing. No, okay. Well, okay Two we'll billion go. men talking sports over delicately rolled, <laughs> uncooked fish. Yes, all right. I'll bet you, I'll, I'll bet you sushi. Saban goes, to, Saban goes to Texas. Okay. And I'm saying this is a guy who's been burned by him. Yes. There's no way. There's no way. Because keep in mind, any time when it, any time Limke and I make a bet that does not involve one team beating another, my my record against him is pretty evil. Uh, that's pretty true. That's yeah. true. When it okay. doesn't involve who's going to win this game, nine times. What is it? I think I'm like maybe like seven, I've got like maybe like a winning percentage of like seven fifty. Yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. And inversely, you have like a one in ten. Yeah, I'm on, uh, in, in, in I mean, come on. I've I, I realistically won one AO Bowl. The only reason I won the second one was because we decided to play the spread that year because Auburn was that freaking bad. And uh, you have uh, Ohio State, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah. I, and the, I think that's it. The golf game, yeah. I have <laughs> six years. Yeah, I have the golf game, and then I have I, I had the golf game, and then I have the Cam Newton AO Bowl where Patrick Peterson got his foot shoved, uh, got uh, his foot broken off. So anyway, let's go ahead and talk some baseball. What does the signing by the New York Yankees of Brian McCann and Jacoby Ellsbury tell you about them not signing Robinson Cano? That they hate me. That they hate me, and they want to make me suffer. Um. Well, I mean, you kind of we they kind of said right out of the gate said, "Look, this is what we're willing to offer you," um, and they had enough cap space to offer him. I think it was eight years, two twenty five. That's a great deal for a second baseman, especially a second baseman of Cano's stats. Right. Um, who's thirty one? Who's yeah? I mean, realistically, that was a hell of a deal. Um, I didn't think that he was going to get two forty for as much as. People were making fun of Jay Z and saying that you know he obviously has no understanding of what's going on and that 350 was too much. He he got 10 years 240 out of Seattle, so you give the guy some credit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, but it, yeah, they they set themselves up that they obviously weren't going to sign Cano. Uh, they had no intention of paying that salary. Um, and they, were, they tried to build a team and give them a team that looked like it's going to be a winner. The Yankees look nasty right now. Yeah, let's go ahead and kind of uh, speed up baseball just a little bit so we can get into the good stuff of the uh, of the final segment. Uh, I agree with you. I think it was more of a I think it's more of a telltale sign of Robinson Cano uh, being the fact that they don't think he's they think he's a good player, but I don't think the, I, I think the Yankees are also trying to say we don't think he's worth that much long term. 
Yeah, there's I, very few players that are worth that long term, especially at 31 years old. Yeah, I mean it's an eight year deal for Seattle. You know, and he'll you know he'll be 40. He'll he'll be almost 40 when the when the deal comes to comes to conclusion. But at the same time, uh, hang on, I got sneeze. Bless me. Um, same time, Robinson Cano to Seattle. The fuck? I definitely wasn't expecting that one. Uh, there was like dark horse candidate, and then there was Seattle. Yeah, there was dark um, horse, and there was Seattle. You're right. Uh, I don't know how this team even is going to look. In all honesty, their young stars are not performing very well. It- Seattle will be bad like Seattle always is. They just now have two all-stars on their team as opposed to one. That's a good point. Yeah, they, they, you know, they'll have two. Instead of the mandatory, oh, we have to take one team, one player from every team for the all-star game, they'll be, you know, Robinson, Cano, and King Felix will both make the team. Yay, congratulations. That's it's, all they've got. It's a shame. He's doing like a reverse A-Rod. Like he wanted to be A-Rod, but now he's going backwards. Yeah, when A Rod was actually good before Roids. All right, at least now he'll uh, have a decent hookup to get Roids. Yeah, good point. Um, let's go ahead and move in. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and skip the Hall of Fame topic. We'll save that for a later day, especially when we, when we actually an- announce the players. But big, real quick, big shout out: Joe Torrey, Tony Larusa, Bobby Cox, all unanimously unanimously inducted into Cooperstown. Very cool about that, but we'll talk about that later on in, in the coming weeks. Finally, in baseball, Roy Halladay announced his retirement today after 16 seasons, signing the obligatory one-year, de- one-day deal, rather, so he could retire as a Toronto Blue Jay. Final thoughts on Doc Halladay? Uh, that is still probably the best signing the Blue Jays have had in a long time. What, for today? <laughs> Yeah, the one-day yeah. deal yeah. is still better than most of the signings that they pulled out. Yeah, especially in the last uh, couple of years. You're right. Um, hell of a pitcher. Shame to see his career having uh, ended this way. Um, but uh, you got me through uh, some fantasy moments there, Roy, and I always appreciated you. Yep. Um, as a Philly, I hated seeing him, seeing him against Atlanta when he was still good. Always made me feel just a little bit anxious. Um, amazing pitcher, um, especially especially during his better years. You know his, his earlier years in Philly when they won the ring, um, and he threw you know he threw the no hitter in the uh, during the regular season, and then the no hitter in the playoffs. That was awesome. Yeah, um, it was. Halliday was Halliday in his prime was one of the nastiest. Yeah. All right, buddy. Um, I've noticed that in the last couple of minutes you have changed into your tuxedo t-shirt, which can only mean one thing. Let's juice it. Yes. Uh, oh my God. Nice. Um, <laughs> but before we so, so to begin our festivities, we turn it over to our master of ceremonies, Mr. Whit McGee. The Heisman Trophy. The name conjures up memories of heroes past, of performances that stand the test of time. Only the most outstanding of players will join the ranks of this elite fraternity. But that trophy gets handed out Saturday night. Each year, the staff and friends of Audibly Offensive Radio work diligently to predict the winner of the most coveted award in college athletics by presenting their own version of the award. In 1935, the first Heisman was awarded. Since then, they've been sold, lost, and won by a guy with a terrible mustache because his son was more than likely murdered by a Heisman winner, but that was never proven. Had something to do with the Chewbacca defense. It is in that tradition that Audibly Offensive Radio proudly presents the Ron Ron Goldman Goldman Classic. Classic. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Lemke and Patrick Swafford. Thank you, Wit. As you've already been made well aware the ron gold the 2012 ron Col- goldman classic is now upon you uh it is our version of the heisman trophy that we have given out every year since 2009 to players such as um mark ingram of alabama cam newton of um auburn university sorry i, I love that there was a beat there <laughs> yeah i can't believe i did that i'm gonna be honest um, oh, uh, we believe it or not, instead of instead of RG three, we actually gave our Ron Goldman Classic in 2011 to Andrew Luck, and then obviously Johnny Manziel won it last year. Um, we did we give it to Manziel or did we give it to uh, uh, Manti Teo? 
You're right. We did give it to Manti Teo. You're right. And look what he's been able to do as a pro. I know. We <laughs> suck at this, dude. But before we get into the announcement, let's uh, let's go ahead and introduce you to our panel, our 19 panel, our panel of 19 voters this year. Obviously, myself and uh, myself and the distinguished Mr. Lemke uh, over here. Uh, also, former um, uh, a former host of our show, Mr. Ty Bob and Reith. Also, Mr. Chris Lundy. Um, the man whose voice you heard begin our begin this uh, begin our show and this segment, the golden voice himself, Mr. Whit McGee. We'd also like to uh, welcome into the fray into the fray uh, as we have every year of uh, uh, you know occasional guest host Krista Turner, um, program director of WWPM Media Net, Mr. Jake Leonard, um, friend of the show and member of Audibly Offensive Radio's baseball and football leagues, Mr. Brian Kriego. Um, the, 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 the infamous and extremely hot Betty, uh, and that takes care of my list, Mr. L- Mr. Limke, uh, from the Limke division. Who do you have? Uh, my family and people that are forced to answer questions because they work for me. Forced um, to answer questions because, uh, forced to answer questions because they work for you. Nice. Uh, I'm going to go through my people of note. Uh, I've got Josh Eisenberg. He's, uh, Russell's own correspondent. And a co-host of Chair Shot Reality, uh, AJ Hunt, former Pitt D1 athlete, uh, Chris Reidenbrough, president of the LSU alumni chapter. Awesome uh, dude, by the way. Awesome dude. Uh, and Chris Muller, uh, 93.7 The Fan, Pittsburgh radio personality. And this year we're absent. One of our people that's been there the past three years, and that's uh, Andrew Filipponi. Um, would you like to please? Would you like to please let everyone know why we have lost Andrew Filipponi? Because this is freaking awesome. Yeah, I, I called him up and I said, "Hey, man, we're doing the Heisman Show. Uh, can I get your your votes?" He said, "I can't, man." He said, "I'm not allowed to fill out a to do any other ballot work." I was like, "Really?" He goes, "I'm actually a Heisman voter this year." There you go. So we now know two Heisman voters: Andrew Filipponi. And Joe Medley from the Aniston Star. We're we're pushing for Lundy here. We're gonna we got a affirmative action his way in there. I mean, dude, if 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 Dan Lebetard's father has a Heisman vote, goddamn it, Chris Lundy should too. That's just all I'm saying. That's just, that's just all I'm saying. Well, as you know, obviously, it, it, just like in the actual Heisman Heisman ballot, you give a you give a top three, your first, your second, and your third place vote. You get three points for first place, two points for second, one point for third, and you can pretty much, as always, vote for anybody, just like you can the Heisman ballot. Um, I uh, um, so I guess let's go ahead and. Get well, let's right do ahead. ours first. We'll do let's let's talk about who we went with. Well, no, uh, well, right. I, I think it kind of goes without saying who's going to win it here. So let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. Then we'll talk about our ballots. Okay. Because I, th- I I think you know if we talk about ours, number one, we're kind of giving it away because fucking duh. So let's go ahead and get the announcement out of the way, ladies and gentlemen. This time we would like to announce the winner of the 2012 Ron Goldman Classic. To Wasa Sopo. He stunned us again. Oh, <laughs> nice. Thank you for doing that. But in reality, quarterback, Florida State, Jameis Winston, uh, Hueytown, Alabama. So, yeah, seriously. I mean, you can't even – you can't deny the guy. He doesn't know the meaning of the word no. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, he has completely just, you know, run through the competition and, you know, taken whatever he's wanted and splurged all over it. <laughs> Yep, went there. They could go all the way, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got a, we got pages of this shit. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and talk about our ballots. Uh, Limke, how'd you fill yours out? Uh, well, I, I, I just don't think you can deny Jameis Winston. Uh, well, hey, but, hey, hold on. Before we get into this, out of our 19 voters, one person le- one person did not – give Jameis Winston a first place vote and that was Whit McGee and I'm not about to bash Whit because Whit's argument was very very valid he voted on your on a player's performance versus strength of schedule and in that vein he went with Trey Mason as his first place vote Jameis Winston as his second and AJ McCarron from Alabama as his third so Strong argument from Witt on that one. Nobody else saw it that way. Everyone else on the ballot 
had Jameis Winston as their first place. So that way we don't have to mention Jameis Winston anymore because it's going to be like, hey, Jake voted for Jameis Winston. Betty voted for Jameis Winston. Jam- everybody else except for Whit McGee gave Jameis Winston the first place vote. So That's how much about easier you, to do it that way. How about your uh, second and third? <laughs> uh, Trey Mason uh, absolutely deserves to be uh, the number two. I mean, what he's done against SEC opponents, what he's done on the biggest stages there possible, uh, 1,600 yards rushing, 22 touchdowns. I mean, it's absolutely incredible, the run that he's had. And I watched this guy just chew up my LSU Tigers defense. And we talked about it the week after. I said, this guy is going to set the world on fire. I was more, we, we talked about what impressed us from the game. And I, I could sit there and, and could have talked all about LSU. And easily, Trey Mason was the most impressive thing, even in that loss. Their sole loss, which was to LSU. How about your third place vote? Uh, Andre Williams, BC. We haven't had a 2,000-yard uh, rusher since 2008, I believe. Uh, rush for 2,100 plus, 17 touchdowns, 6.4 yards per carry. Most interesting stat, though, of those yards, he did not catch a single pass. Right. It's all rushing. All yards. rushing yards. Good God. Yeah. Zero receiving yards, all rushing. That's that. That's the that's incredible. Nuts. Thing. Yeah. That, that is, is nuts. Yeah, especially in this day and age of offense. Well, I'm going to speak for both my ballot and my wife's ballot because it actually folded the exact same way completely incidentally because she filled hers out at work and I filled mine out at home. Jameis Winston, obviously number one. Trey Mason at two. A.J. McCarron at three. Um, We both felt that Mason played his way into it over the last three games, and A.J. McCarron's performance in the Iron Bowl was – it was worthy of the third place vote as opposed to Andre Andre Williams from BC. We think well, obviously Williams not having the grand stage that both Mason and McCarron had played against him in our in both of our opinions. We discussed this um, we we discussed this last night while I was t- kind of tallying everything up. So that's how every that's how everybody in the Swafford House went. Uh, I I went back and forth. Um, I'm very, very upset that uh, Derek Carr, who led FBS uh, uh, in as a passer, got was snubbed. not invited. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I over would've, Jordan Lynch. I would have. Uh, yeah, I agree. I would have rather had D- D- Derek Carr over Jordan Lynch. Um, kind of. Let's go ahead and give a full breakdown of how everything went. Jameis Winston got obviously, you know, 18 of 19 first place votes for a grand total of 56. Total points. Um, Trey Mason. Uh, Trey Mason was on one first place ballot, and on a lot, I believe I counted a total of six. Uh, hang on, real quick. One, two, and then four. Yeah, yeah. Total of six second place votes and got a total of eighteen points. Oh. Uh, uh, Williams was third in the voting with thirteen points, followed by AJ McCarron, and they were the only ones that got. Um, double-digit points. Others receiving votes, Jordan Lynch had uh, six points. Braxton Miller, Johnny Manziel, and Derek Carr all had two points. Marcus Mariota and Carlos Hyde each got one third-place vote apiece. Um, and honestly, this is this is how... It, I don't know how second and third place will play out because I honestly think uh, Andre Williams will get a lot more love in the um uh from the voters than he got from us obviously this is just a 19 person sampling but it's going to be Jameis winston how can it not be i mean i i think it, it's very much going to end up uh i i just don't think you could deny what what trey mason did uh i just i i just don't think you can and to have the amount of carries that he did against top flight defenses it, it was stunning it, it just – it really was, and he was the motor behind every single one of their wins. Completely agreed. Uh, I, you know, even though Andre Williams rushed for 2,000 yards and Trey Mason only rushed for 1,600, it was what Andre – it was what Mason did with his 1,600 that I think eclipses the 20 
it, it it was it was what I, what Mason did with his 1600 yards and 22 touchdowns that eclipses what Andre Williams did with his 2200 yards and 17 touchdowns. Yeah, Mason had an extra game too. Yeah, where he got 300 yards. Right. <laughs> um, I, I I like Andre Williams a lot. I think he's going to go out there. He's going to be um, looked at as a high draft pick. Um, but yeah, I just don't think you can deny, uh, Mason and him being the backbone. There's one, you know what? I'm going to get, I'm going to do one thing here. I'm going to step away from a claim that I made, okay. um, earlier in the show when we talked about prospective coach of the year, uh, I said, uh, if Jimbo Fisher gets Florida state, to the number one ranking to the national championship, uh, he's going to be your coach of the year. I want to rescind that. I'm about to say, yeah, you need to rescind that. You needed to rescind that two weeks ago when you said it. Um, and uh, that, that was what three weeks ago, wasn't it? That was Something a while like ago. Something like that. It was, it was before. It was well before the Alabama game. And I said, oh, by, and by the way, yeah, it was before the Bama game. It was before the Georgia game. And when you when you still said it, I called you crazy. Yeah, you did. You did, absolutely. And uh, I, I absolutely 100% rescind that argument now. <laughs> yeah, and because – let's face it. The coach of the year has to be Gus Malzahn. Yeah, it, it does. There's, there's no argument in this because you don't take a team that fell on its ass because of horrible coaching and went three and eight. Take those exact same players. As winless in the SEC. Winless in the SEC for the first time in school history. And Things are looking up, Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, but they're not replacing their coach. They replaced their coach, and they went 0-8. So, yeah. Um, yeah, coach of the year has to be Gus Malzahn. Absolutely. There's, just, there's no question about it. I mean, and – I mean, his offense poses a matchup problem. I, as much – I. As much as I don't particularly like this announcer or this broadcaster, Jack Arute, who does a really who does a pretty good show on uh, XM Radio, he was doing a, uh, he was doing a preview of the SEC championship game. Uh, I was listening to it on the way home from work, and he had a very good analogy about Auburn's triple option offense. And he said it's the New York Shell game. You know, you've got. You you've got three cups and you three cups and you don't know where the ball is. You don't know which one of the which one of the cups has the ball. It's so sleight of hand. And I was like, that's actually a pretty damn good analogy. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, so, um, but we have a month to talk about to to build up towards what is probably going to be the highest scoring national championship game in history because I don't think there is a chance either defense can stop the other. No, it's it's definitely going to be an interesting game. Yeah. Uh, hell of a lot more interesting than anything Florida State's played this year. Exactly. Well, buddy, before we get out of here, any final thoughts on the Ron Golden Classic? Anything else we've discussed tonight? Um, you know me well. No. Okay. I, I got to do that every time now. Yeah, I was I was trying to see how long you were going to hold it. It gets longer and longer every week. Every <laughs> try. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for myself, for um, the disembodied voice of Whit McGee, for our executive vice pres- president of standards and practices, who is in the background giggling. Uh, you heard him a little while ago. For my best friend, Mr. Chris Linky, for all of our Heisman or all of our Ron Golden and Classic voters this week, we thank you for uh, for your participation. Until next week, my name is Patrick Swafford. We'll see you next week on Audibly Offensive Radio when Chris Lemke says... Ding dong! The BCS is dead!